looking forward to a great conversation with you all. Um, we will be sharing a little bit about Child Haven, um, our strategic initiatives coming up in the future here, um, and we'll have a panel of Child Haven leaders um, where we'll do some questions and answers um, based on, on what we present here and other questions that you may have brought into our session today. So um, I'm going to, um, the way that the format's going to work is we'll do um, a quick introduction of our panelists, and then we're going to show you a short little video put out by the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And the reason we do that is it does a fabulous job of laying the foundation for our strategic impact plan. So we'll spend five minutes doing the video, um, talk about that for just a moment, and then we'll, um, we'll have uh, John Botten, our CEO, do some interview questions with our panelists, and then we're going to open it up to everybody. So if you come up with questions as we're going through before we get to the open Q&A part, feel free to write those down, keep them, keep them um, with you, and then we'll open it up and you can put those into the chat or raise your hand or just shout them out if you'd like. So um, that's kind of the flow for today. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, have John and our panelists that are here with us today, go ahead and introduce yourselves. And um, in addition to your name and um, what you do at Child Haven, maybe how long you've been here, if you would also share a little bit about what has brought you to this work and to Child Haven. I know it's really great for folks to get to hear that as well. So John, I'll pass it to you first. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Christy. Um, thanks for joining us, everybody. Great to have you. We uh, always look forward to doing these. Um, there's so many things that have, have drawn me to this work. Um, I, I kind of summarize it in three different areas. Uh, the first is based on the proven efficacy in, of prevention and early intervention services, where we know we can have the greatest positive influence and we also get the greatest return on investment. Um, my second reason is a real heartfelt desire to help create equ equitable opportunities for all kids, all families, and all communities. And we know from the research that that is not currently the case. And my third why is a desire to help change the narrative. And by that, I mean, it can be comforting for us to pretend that childhood trauma and adversity happen to other people. Um, it doesn't happen in my neighborhood. It doesn't happen in my home. It doesn't happen where I live. But in reality, childhood trauma happens in every neighborhood, and it can happen in any home, and including mine. Uh, and I think we'd all be better off if we do less othering and uh, more relationship building. And hopefully we'll get an opportunity to do that today. You want me to kick it over to someone, Christy? Mr. Gould. Thank you, John. Hello, everybody. I'm John Gould. I'm the Chief Community Impact Government Relations Officer here at Child Haven. Um, what draws me here is that I passionately believe in the power and potential of working in and with community. You know, one of my personal values is that communities know best what the solutions to their challenges are. Um, I'm excited to be part of Child Haven because really the power of early relational health, which we're gonna talk about today, um, I'm excited about that that power to improve outcomes for children, families, and early relational health happens in community. Kids and families can't thrive unless they're in healthy and thriving communities. And there are all sorts of ways to have healthy communities. The way that I've had the honor of doing that over the years is through public policy advocacy. And I'm inspired by working for an organization that believes in working with community to change policies and systems to achieve positive and sustained outcomes for kids and families. Um, I will pass it over to my colleague, Gil. Thanks, John. Uh, I am drawn to work for several reasons. Uh, the first one is just really building the adult capacity of the adults around children. Just how can we best support them so they can support the children in their care? and for those they interact with in their community. And then over the weekend, I was doing some training with some adults, and uh, it became really clear that I think I initially entered the work to be a helper. And after really reflecting on that this weekend, it's not about really being a helper. It's really about how do I support and collaborate with those that I'm trying to influence because as John said, it's really the community knows best in what they need and 
how to implement those strategies. So it's my job to help them figure that out. <clears throat> I will pass it over to Meg. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess it's technically uh, afternoon, so good afternoon. Um, I'm going to answer the question a little differently because I'm what they call a Child Haven bounce back. I worked at Child Haven 20 years ago um, as a therapeutic case manager. And Gil, you and I did not coordinate, but I was going to say something very similar, which is always so symbiotic. Um, I love the work back then, it, less about being a provider, but more being a, a witness. Um, we've, um, you know, back then, the work, you know, certainly I, I think we've um, reconciled and and changed our service delivery and some of the problematic uh, patterns of, of our service delivery back then. But the core of the work of, of getting to witness um, a family, a uh, parent sort of start their um, parenting journey with your young child, getting to see that change that we just don't get to see. I Before Child Haven, I worked with adolescents and, and you don't get to be a part of and, and witness that kind of change. So I think that's really compelling. Um, we, I think, you know, we know the investment in the first five years of life just makes good economic sense too. So that resonates for me. Um, but outside of nostalgia and, and the economics, um, right now, Child Haven is in the middle of a, an organizational transformation. And I, that's super exciting to me. So that's why I'm thrilled I'm back. I always joke that I've scoured Child Haven's Help Wanted uh, pages for, you know, two decades. Um, but to be back here right now is is kind of a sweet time because we're engaged in so many exciting endeavors, including our continuum of care, which I think I'll get to talk about in a little bit. But um, we're also obviously doing a lot of workforce development work and public um, will work, um, being embedded in communities. So I, I I think there's a lot to be excited about as we sort of, as John uh, Botton talked about, as we embark on making sure that there's equitable opportunities for all families. So. There's a lot more to say, but I, I'll, I'll uh, kick it to Fernanda. Um. Thanks, Meg. Hi, everyone. My name is Fernanda. I am a public policy specialist at Child Haven, and I am also a Pathways Fellow. Um, well, what draws me to this work, I think, is my big interest in mental health. Um, I think, in general, there's so much more attention on education than on mental health. And there's no much attention in how it can change people's lives and opportunities. Um, as part of my work in the early childhood field, I learned about um, the adverse childhood experiences and how they affect the development of children and their future. Um, and also how um, BIPOC children are disproportionately affected by, by that. Um, so my interest in working with Child Haven is based on the acknowledgement the organization has about this fact and also the services and the support that Child Haven staff provides to families, children, and communities so they can overcome and overcome barriers and, and thrive. And I'll pass it to, I think, Emin, the last one. Yes, I think so. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, we will return to you shortly. But before we do that, we're going to take about five minutes and we're going to watch this short video, as I mentioned before, that's put out by the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. It does a really wonderful job of laying the foundation for our strategic initiatives and our approach. And so I'm, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share that and get that rolling for us. And then we'll be back here in, in just a couple minutes after this video. Um, I just need a quick head, thumbs up, thumbs down, if volume is okay, thumbs up. The social challenges that face modern societies, whether it's the ability to work productively, to be a good citizen, stay healthy, have their roots in early health and development. A strong foundation in early childhood results in much better and more effective development later. A weak foundation really puts us behind. The most important thing children need to thrive is to live in an environment of relationships that begins in their family 
but also extends out to include adults who are family members in child care centers and other programs. What children need is for that entire environment of relationships to be invested in their healthy development. We've shown from decades of testing interventions that we can improve outcomes. But the magnitude of those impacts is not good enough. Science is now available to help us think about what we might do that would have a bigger impact than the best of what we've done before. So we began to ask, what could we be doing differently? What could we do to be smarter? Children who are at the greatest risk for the poorest outcomes in learning and health and behavior are children who experience a pile-up, a cumulative burden of one after another after another of risk factors. And then the burden is more than any child could be expected to overcome. So we began to focus on the development of the adults. What could we be doing to strengthen the capacity of everyone who interacts with children? This led us to think about the kinds of skills you need to deal with adversity. These skills of focusing attention, planning, monitoring, delaying gratification, being able to solve problems, being able to work in teams, executive function and self-regulation. They're also the kind of skills you need to create a well-regulated home and school environment in which healthy development and learning can take place. And then brain science started to tell us that differences in those skills start to develop in infancy based on the environment kids live in. So how do those skills get built? Well, if you don't develop them early, how do you develop them later? Actually, you can build them later because the period of flexibility and plasticity for this part of the brain doesn't fully mature until age 25 to 30. And then the light bulb went on. The reason we're not getting a bigger impact is not because we don't know about how to influence development, but because we're giving information and advice to people who we need to do active skill building with. Skill building by coaching, by training, by practice. But we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. So try this. How does that work? That's a new idea. Buen trabajo. We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. And also the community can help to build and reinforce the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community and how can we reduce them? Moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies strengthening communities' abilities to reduce source of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need? The development of our human capital is our future. The development of a productive workforce is our future. The development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society, it's critical for a thriving business, it's critical for successful environment and relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. All right. So, I love that video. Um, I am really interested though, I don't know how many folks who, who are with us today have seen this before, but I'd be really interested to hear, you know, what jumped out at you? Did anything surprise you in this video? Um, and, and also, is there anything that you thought of as they were talking about the needs of the community? Is there anything that jumped out to you um, related to the needs, the implications of this video for our community? So you can answer either question. <laughs> 
And you can feel free to just jump right in or you can raise your hand or put something in the chat either, whichever way you'd like to go. Anybody surprised? Guys are a tough crowd. Meg and Gil, I just want to acknowledge I'm very much working on being quiet. Um, I do want to leave space if there was anything that jumped out to anyone. Um, feel free to put that into the chat. Um, but I'll go ahead if, if we're feeling a little, a little shy or don't want to speak up in front of the group, that's totally fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to John B and our panel, and we're going to talk a bit about Child Havens initiatives and how those correlate to the video that we just watched. So bear with us as we get everybody spotlighted. Um, take it away, John. All right. I'm off mute. All right, so um, just highlight a few a few things from the video that stood out to us as, as we watched this over um, through the years. Um, and it was really a driving force for our strategic impact plan, as well as a lot of deep listening that we did to the community and research around best practices in the field. But in order to improve child outcomes, we need to build adult capacities. We must take a more holistic, uh, what we call ecosystem approach, it really focuses on three things, enriching relationships in all settings in which kids live, learn, and play, uh, build, diversify, and enhance the child and family serving workforce, and then in partnership, address the silos and systems that keep problems entrenched. And those three areas correlate perfectly with the, what we call the three tiers of our strategic impact plan, which looks like this. So this is our, our ecosystem approach. Uh, to drive our vision, which is that all children are safe, healthy, and thriving, and pointing out that everything that we do is always done in partnership, uh, primarily with families and communities, but also with other community-based organizations, many of whom have joined on this call, um, public school districts, universities, medical systems, et cetera. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, take each of these tiers one by one, and I'm going to ask the leader who is responsible for kind of leading that body of work uh, to speak to it. So starting with Tier one, which is at the family level, the video talked about active skill building. Uh, the objective here is to strengthen our infrastructure and direct services with a goal to go from serving about 300 kids and families when we started this to, to 3,000. You can see our two major initiatives in this area. So with that, I'm going to introduce Meg again. And the question I have for you, Meg, is can you please speak to some of the exciting things that we have going on in our direct services, uh, what we call our continuum of care? and how the principles and practices of infant and early childhood mental health are the foundation for everything that we do. Sure, two-part question, which I'll, I'll do my best to be succinct about. I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. So well, like, let's first talk about continuum of care. Um, and I thought it might be useful just to even say what, what we mean about that because we might all hear that term quite a bit. Um, you know, of course it really refers to intensity of services and, and you know, going from least intense to most intense. Really what it means on a service delivery model is that we have options and flexibility for families, which as you can imagine is a pretty wonderful uh, thing because people are complex and they're not so linear. And enough of us service providers have been in the world to see that once a family has stabilized, they often sort of get kicked off a service. And because we have a continuum of care at Child Haven, um, that's not the case, right? So if, if um, if a family who might have come in with high acuity is suddenly is, you know, after some work and services and time might, you know, re you know, require less um, intensive services, we, we often have that. So they don't have to go find a new service or find new providers. In fact, um, in our continuum of care, they're going to probably be with providers who have been collaborating and probably have shared language. Um, and anyone who has been looking the past few years for services know what know what an absolute um uh difficult and um frustrating process that is so i think just to sort of share kind of our, our understanding of continuum of care um i think it's useful just to think about the the family's experience of that as well as the providers because we feel like as providers you can imagine we want a warm handoff for our families so i want to just give three quick examples um one is our WISE, which is not just our one of our most intensive services, but one of the state's most intensive services, wraparound um, uh, mental health um, 
and um, uh, pardon me, and uh, like a facilitation of of uh, case management in the home. So three providers per case, um, which is, as you might imagine, pretty rare. Um, and when it turns out when we have well-resourced care, we uh, outcomes are better. So um, WISE is a wonderful example of, of our one of our more intense programs where when, you know, after time, when they graduate, it's a really big deal for us. And then they might go on to outpatient mental health um, within Child Haven, or they might not. They might uh, have another service in the community and we we have the capacity to help families find those other services um so that's one example where you might go from a more intense to a to a less intense um but and you could as you can imagine it goes the other way too so someone a family a kiddo might be in early learning and perhaps there's been some trauma exposure there might be routines um, or dynamics in the classroom which are just regulating or distressing to a kid um so we have um Therapeutic Early Learning, um, which I believe uh, Gil will be talking more about, our CLIP, Eclipse program. Um, so again, uh, the keto doesn't have to get kicked out. Uh, the child can stay in the classroom. That's point one. Point two is that caregivers don't have to go find services. And point three, just as the video talked about, um, the adults are going to get uh, support and they're going to collaborate. So it's not just about the a caregiver or a parent or a family member. It's also the teacher or the director of that of that program. So really sort of thinking about a kiddo with, uh, about the, the system around the kiddo. And again, that we can kind of do that pretty nimbly within our continuum of care, having 13 service lines uh, at Child Haven allows us some flexibility. And the last one, and I, I could talk about this one um, all afternoon. I'm trying to figure out a way to, to talk about this briefly. Um, some of you know about our Art with Heart program. It's um, very briefly, it's a um, basically an art therapy program. Um, we produce books um, and there's a com companion guide for parents and caregivers and providers. How do you sit with a child who's doing expressive art, who's trying to you know, sort of um, share their world in an in a artistic way? To make a long story short in our continuum of care, we are trying to produce new books and books for younger children. And so, We've got providers from four different programs sitting together and brainstorming about our next title. And one of the things that this just happened about a week or two ago, super exciting. One of the things that occurred to me is these are providers who don't normally get to work together, but also it just reminded me that regardless of the level of distress or acuity that a kid might be experiencing, the fact that kids might want to have paint between their toes or, the, or a toddler might want to experiment with some uh, sensory experiences uh, that sort of that experience was true for all of the four providers on that call. And I think that was I think that's a pretty exciting thing to see that we there is more that unites us, that, that kids do have some shared needs and shared um, developmental tasks to get through and that we can help scaffold that. So I think I don't know. You asked what was exciting, John. That was pretty exciting to me <laughs> that we can help parents partner in that way. It's pretty great. So I'll stop. Your enthusiasm comes through. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Meg. So the, the next tier of the impact plan is the community level, where the objective is to expand our workforce and in indirect service with a goal to influence 30,000. Uh, Gil is the leader of uh, this body of work. And uh, Gil, my question for you is, could you please talk about the start with the Center for IECMH Excellence? and its objective to grow, diversify, and better support the child-serving workforce. Thanks, John. Uh, gosh, I can't express how exciting this work is. So uh, we started with our work here at Child Haven. Uh, we just presented uh, the basics of infant and early childhood mental health, and no matter whether you are the janitor at our early learning center or you are the CEO, we came together and we learned about infant mental health together and how we can support um, best outcomes for kids in a variety of ways. And so the dream for the center really is to help those, whether, again, you are Joe Schmo with no kids, or you are pediatricians. We know pediatricians are the first contact with the system that a family has. 
that you want to explore a child's infant mental health and how can you best do that within your 15 minutes or are there additional supports that we need to think about that aren't there so it's a really exciting endeavor endeavor so we have our training portion and the second exciting part of this is really the the workforce development piece so we are working together with the Bernard Center and Wayne to really think more deeply about workforce development. What does it look like? How do we get more people to identify themselves as infant mental health providers? Thanks, Gil. Quick, quick follow up. Could you do a, a quick summary of the therapeutic early learning capacity building program? We refer to it as TELCAP, which is the evolution of our legacy program, which was known as Eclipse. Definitely, John. And John's famous at long titles of things. So I really appreciate him naming that for me. So what that program is, so earlier we talked about capacity building. And so what is great about our Eclipse program is it does this in two ways. First, really thinking about that child in the classroom who is not only having big behaviors, but also that child who kind of melts into the background that maybe, you know, doesn't cause a lot of problems, but also doesn't have a lot of friends, maybe plays by themselves a lot more. So really thinking about that odd spectrum, not just thinking about that kid who <laughs> we pray sometimes doesn't show up at school, right? But really building the capacity about the adult of you know what, if I can provide a safe space for Johnny today so his mom can get to work and feel like he's in a safe place, like, then I've done my job today. So really helping uh, reframe that thought of that child. And then being able to work with that parent and help them think about, okay, what's the teacher doing at school? Or what can I help the teacher do at school? So that way that child, my child doesn't have that challenging behavior. And maybe it's as simple as that transfer of care of singing a song together and letting Johnny know that, hey, Miss Juanita's a great teacher and she's gonna take care of you while I'm gone. And I can't wait to see you at the end of the day so you can tell me all the wonderful things that you've done. And then really working on bridging that gap between school and the family. Thanks, Gil. So when we were creating the plan, we thought about stopping here. So remember our vision, all children safe, healthy, and thriving. And if we're growing our direct services, our continuum of care, and we're building and diversifying the workforce, could we realistically make kind of the progress towards the vision that we want? And the honest answer was no, because there are systemic issues that hold those problems in place. And then if we're not actually um, have initiatives addressing those systemic issues, we really doubted our ability to advance that vision. So uh, with that, my next question is to John Gould and Fernanda. Um, why are systemic changes needed for positive outcomes for children and families? Hi, everybody. Um, it's really an honor to work in this newer area of Child Haven's work. I'll start by answering John's question about why systemic changes are needed. And then um, Fernanda is gonna give some examples. And first of all, it's so fun to be spotlighted um, with all of you. Thank you, Michaela, for the spotlight. Um, so as we know, adverse community environments are literally toxic to children and families. Um, and they are especially toxic to young children. So we include system change in our strategic impact plan because really of humility about the role of direct services. Um, even the best direct services, even the best continuum of care, even the highest quality services will not help families dismantle some of the systemic barriers that stand in the way of their hopes and their dreams. Direct social services are vital. We are proud of our direct social services. We're proud to be in an ecosystem that offers direct services, but they're never gonna be expansive enough to achieve population level progress. And we acknowledge that many families in our community are not in child haven programs. Those families deserve their hopes and dreams too. So systemic barriers like 
racism and poverty and disparities in health and education can really only be dismantled by changing the systems that created those barriers. Um, I wish it were as easy as that excavator in the video where that big excavator grabbed the rock that said poverty and just lifted it up and moved it away. It's not that easy, um, but it's vital. And you know we need strategies that will reduce the trauma and adversity that many children and families face and strategies that create more positive buffering adult-child relationships. So working to transform systems and particularly with the lens of making our systems more responsive to early childhood, um, we will see less trauma and adversity in the lives of children and families. And we'll make a difference and we'll do our part to achieving population level health. Uh, Fernanda's now gonna share some examples of what Child Haven's work in this arena looks like with our partners. And we have a few slides to illustrate as well. Take it away, Fernanda. Thanks, John. Um, so one example is the first picture that you see there is with our, the Marshallist community. Child Haven um, has a kaleidoscope play and learn uh, program at Auburn and provides bilingual um, services to the Marshallist community. And we had Representative Enterman over. She came to visit us on November and it was a great opportunity um, for her and for the community. So she was able to share with them and hear from the caregivers how uh, this program supports the community and why it's important to keep funding um, the Kaleidoscope Play and Learn at Child Haven's uh, urban location. We also have a point team and advocacy team at Child Haven. Uh, this was created over a year ago. Um, there are, a, right now we are five members uh, and it's open to anybody in Child Haven who wants to contribute and learn and participate in uh, policy and advocacy. So we meet twice a month and the idea is to advance and keep working and expanding Child Haven's work in the field. And another example is the partnership with Pathways. So Pathways was created to empower leaders of color. I'm honored to be one of them. I'm a fellow for Pathways. And the idea of Pathways is that we, the people of color can equitable, equitably drive and shape the design of policies that affect kids and communities. So Child Haven is one of the placement sites for this um, organization. Thank you. Uh, these pictures are for Child Haven's first advocacy day. It was an exciting opportunity for families, board members, and staff to really go into the advocacy role. Um, we had around 25 members um, in Olympia. Uh, they had, we all had the opportunity to meet with legislators. We met around 15 legislators and it was a great experience for people to um, make some connections with the legislators that didn't know it was that easy and to get more empowered into their advocacy roles. Um, we had the Marshallist community with us. We also have some partners from early ECAP. And yeah, it was a great experience. We look forward to keep bringing staff and community to these opportunities of policy and advocacy. Thank you, Fernanda. So uh, as many of you know, who are working on policies in the current legislative session, we're, we're five days away from the potential end of the 2023 legislative session. Um, this slide just shows a few of the things that we've been working on. Um, the first one is we focus a lot on early childhood special education advocacy 
Um, there's been a lot of focus by the legislature this year on special ed and K-12, and we believe that it's it starts early. Um, so Michaela just put in the chat a beautiful op-ed written by Fernanda and Dr. Abby Grant, who is a Child Haven partner and board member with Harborview Pediatrics. Um, it's an excellent read um, and asserts that the legislature needs to focus also on early childhood special ed. We've been advocating with partners for both uh, more slots and rates in the state-funded preschool program, ECAP, and its sister program, Early ECAP. We're hopeful to achieve a rate increase of 16 to 18% that'll help us compensate our excellent early childhood workforce, not only at Child Haven, but around the state. And then in partnership with the Skyway community, we've been advocating for funding in the capital budget for a new development uh, on vacant land in Skyway that will co-locate affordable housing and early learning operated by Child Haven. Just a snapshot of a few things that we've been working on this legislative session. Back to you, John. Thank you all. Christy, I think it's back to you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Little little technical difficulty there. Um, great. So this is the opportunity now. We've we've done our introductions, and um, now we have an opportunity to have anybody else from um, from you all. Any other questions that you might have, or things that you'd like us to elaborate on? I should say we intentionally went very quickly over some pretty big initiatives, but um, we wanted to leave space for your questions to guide our conversation today. So, um, any questions or things that you would like folks to elaborate on a bit more? And again, you can raise your hand, put it in the chat, go ahead and just jump in. I had one question uh, for, yeah. for John. I wondered how, how it was just five days left, how has the salary increase for people? How is it in both of the budgets? How does it look for um, moving ahead to final passage? Oh, you're muted, John. Sorry, I'm muted. I couldn't see you. Could you tell me your name? Sherry. Sherry, thank you for the question, Sherry. Uh, the um, I was referring to rate increases for people who provide uh, ECAP or early ECAP. Um, both the Senate and House have rate increases in their budgets. So they range from 16 to 18 percent. Um, and of course, this is just one part of our overall you know, early childhood and social service workforce. Um, but that is progress. It would be the biggest rate increase for that program that the state has ever adopted. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Dave Mintz, I see your hand up. Go ahead and I can ask hey. you a question. Thank you, Christy. Yeah. I was curious, this is a question for Fernanda and maybe also for John Gold, if you have any comments about if you have anything more you might say about the path pathways program, I think it was called, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, what your experience with that's been and any, any learning that the group at large has, uh, has come to that's notable. Fernanda, you want to start? Sure. Um, thanks. So yeah, this is a 20 month fellowship. I've been so far for six months uh, and it, there are nine different organizations in this fellowship. From my perspective, it's been a great experience for people of color. I think there's a lot of knowledge and expertise in direct services providers. So it is important to have that voices in this field and hear from people who has been working directly with families, people who is close to their communities and people who has experienced experience by her firsthand the barriers of the systems. Um, that's what I can say uh, about Pathways. I feel like it's a great opportunity to bring the voices of um, people of color to the field. John? It's been an excellent opportunity for Child Haven and I would encourage any other potential placement sites uh, to look into it. 
for us, it represents a couple of things. One, um, uh, ability to grow our capacity in public policy advocacy. We, we cost share the position with, with Pathwaves. Uh, the second is it allows us to support the professional development of people of color who work in early childhood and um, help them fulfill their hopes and dreams. And um, in this case, moving from direct service to, to policy advocacy. And then also we get to be part of a community of practice with the other placement sites. Um, and together we're looking at ways to promote more racial equity and early learning together. So we get connected to a community of other sites as well. Great question, Dave. Other questions? I, I'll actually float a question out there um, because I, I often like to ask this question. I know Megan Gill and others have mentioned this concept of infant and early childhood mental health. Um, and I also know from experience that most folks don't really know what that means. Um, and it's not, you know, babies on couches with their therapist, um, but maybe Meg or Gill or whoever would like to, can you share just a little bit more about what we are talking about when we talk about infant and early childhood mental health or IECMH as you may have seen in the presentation? They're both pointing at each other. All right, I'm gonna call on Gil first and then Meg can fill in. How's that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, my mom's gonna be really mad at me for not laying a lady go for so just remember I just want you to know that um so you'll often hear it in a variety of ways you'll hear infant mental health you'll hear relational health we haven't quite found a term that everyone really feels comfortable with and uh, it's for a variety of reasons one of the biggest reasons probably is because mental health is linked with mental illness and that was part of our naming of the center itself. And thinking about like giving power back to people to say mental health is health. So really going into infant mental health, what we're really doing is talking about everything that we've talked about today, really looking at the adults in the child's life and thinking together with them about how can we best support the adults so they can support the kids. Because at the end of the day, they are the ones that are with that child every day. What are the skills that they need to remain calm when that child just won't stop crying in the middle of the night? And unfortunately, it may bring up some stuff that's not so pleasant for that adult. So how can we best help them learn a new skill so they can help their child? I think the other important thing about infant mental health is really thinking about it in terms of the context of their community and also their um, cultural identity. So really thinking about what does that look like for that family and that within that culture? Because my way isn't the perfect way. And someone else's way is better for them. So really thinking about that in those terms. And Meg, I, you've been wonderful to work with in doing these initial trainings. So uh, please add on. That's always your tough act to follow. So um, maybe I'll just add what it looks like at um, Child Haven. Um, and earlier, Christy made a reference to that she, uh, Christy's working on being quiet. It's not because... Gil and I are asking her to quiet down or do less talking is because one of the core um, uh, components of infant and early child mental health is this idea of reflection. And so we are working on reflective supervision throughout the organization. And, and as we talk to our fellow providers and, and those of you that are on the call, um, it isn't, it's not common that your, you know, your chief of human resources or your C FO has gone through reflective supervision. And it really is sort of a chance for all of us to, to think about this work um, and slow down um, our own our own uh, thought processes and 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 be reflective with one another. Um, and you referenced Gil um, the training this weekend. Um, we're and I talked earlier about shared language. Um, 
so one of the, uh, another key component of infant early childhood mental health is the idea of being strength-based. So instead of going problem-based and therefore we're experts, it's really sort of thinking about what, what the strengths of families um, and kiddos, you know, have already. And we had this lovely aha moment where some um, early learning providers were talking about the idea of being strength-based and someone said, oh, well, I do positive reinforcement with my kids. And we talked about that's being strength-based. And so now they have shared language, but also this sort of thing of, oh, I'm doing this. And so we kind of almost codify it together as a team. Um, and I'd, I guess I'd also talk about, as you um, mentioned, Gil, um, we think a lot about the cultural and racial context of families. And we do that at Child Haven um, through sort of making sure we're looking at our, our bias um, and being actively um, in dialogue around, you know, um, not just about bias, but but being actively anti-racist. And and while infant and early childhood mental health is not the only um, nor the exclu exclusive um, framework that's brought this conversation to light, we certainly are proud to to certainly expand that and to and to further it. So I think those are the ways I think about it in terms of the organization. Thank you both. I think one of the interesting learnings for me as I've learned more about infant early childhood mental health is that it's it doesn't only relate to to young children necessarily the the framework um this approach to the work it, it applies across all of our services even the ones that serve adolescents for example so thank you both for sharing a bit more what other questions can we answer for you today you've got a wonderful panel of experts in their own right um what else would be helpful for us to share Hi, yeah, this is Darlene Guerrero with uh, Hilltop Children's Center, and I love everything that you all are talking about today, and I'm wondering, what are your measurables? Like, how are you going to know that you're achieving the goals that you're setting up? Wonderful question. It's a, it's a great question, Darlene, especially because... Um, so many of our services are also focused on prevention, which is tough to prove. Um, you all on the panel thought that I was unmuting because I was going to take this question, but I'm not. So let's see who wants to jump in and share a bit because it, it varies from program to program, but I'd love to have somebody else jump in. Maggie, you want to go first? Yeah, you know, I, I think I can start by saying it's an area that we're still figuring out. You know, Child Haven had one service um, for decades and decades. And in a very short period of time, we added uh, 12 additional service lines and um, went through two mergers and a thing called COVID. And so we're trying to figure that out. Um, what one of the approaches has been is implementing um, services that have evidence base behind them doing those services to fidelity and using that as a bit of a proxy in some of the services uh, for, you know, efficacy or outcomes. Um, you know, the outputs are pretty easy to measure, you know, in terms of the goals related to number of kids and, and number of people trained through the, the center, et cetera. But, but the outcomes admittedly are, are harder to do. And certainly the longitudinal outcomes are, are, are really hard for us to do because we are often not able to track, um, you know, the kids, you know, once they leave child haven, I will say that since we've grown our continuum of care and expanded the ages of serve kids serve, we've been able to do a better job of that because there used to be kind of this five, six year old cliff where kids were, you know, just frankly kicked out at that point. And now we're, we're able to uh, keep them. And, you know, some of we have, you know, teens and the late stages of teens and all the way up to 24. So some of the, the kids and families that go through multiple programs, um, you know, we're able to track over time a little bit better, but we haven't figured out a way to aggregate that in a, in a presentation yet, but brilliant question. And if you've figured it out, um, contact us and we're all ears. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you, darling. I think we've got time for at least one more question if anybody wants to jump in. Eileen, go ahead. First of all, I love the dual approach of wonderful programs and balancing that with systems change. It's just so needed, everything in the video. Um, wondering, when you're talking about growing the continuum of care, are you also exploring expanding geographic reach as you do that? Uh, 
That's a yeah. John Botton. That's John Botton, the answer right there. <laughs> you want me to go first? Um, so we didn't speak to it, but in the video, or I mean, in the in the PowerPoint, there was a a, a line of strategy that said embed services within communities and expand our reach, and it was it was uh, in the tier one and continuum of care area. And as many of you know, we sold our our Broadway building, the building that we had been on, you know, that property since 1921, really to drive that strategy. And um, the kids and families that we serve could no longer afford in that community uh, due to gentrification and other other factors. And so. Uh, we had this amazing asset that we said we we need to deploy in a different way in order to um, better serve these kids and families. So, so different services are expanding now um, into uh, neighboring counties, Pearson, Snohomish County, and certainly the the goal of the Center for Excellence and Workforce Development is statewide and even nationally. So, different programs and different strategies have different ambitions, but I feel confident saying that yeah, we're definitely kind of going from the 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 hub of Seattle and 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 expanding out, um, and hopefully statewide in the near future. Great. I actually lied. I think we have time for one more question if, if there's another one. Um, and if not, we can certainly wrap, but great questions. I like the variety. I don't see any hands. So maybe I'll, um, I'll go ahead and ask a question of our panelists. Um, could you each just share one thing? There's a lot that we've talked about that's on the horizon at Child Haven. Could you share one thing that you're specifically excited about? And I'm going to pass it to Fernanda first. How's that? Um, well, something that I'm very excited about is the growth that Child Haven is having in the uh, policy and advocacy field. I feel that it's very needed um, to work on systemic change. And that Child Haven is uh, contributing to that is very exciting. Do I pass it to somebody? Sure, that works. I'll pass it to Meg. Thanks, Fernanda. Um, I feel like I just exuded all this enthusiasm earlier about what I'm excited about. Um, I, I think I'm really most excited about embedding infant and early childhood mental health uh, even deeper in the organization and, and seeing that grow um, uh, and watching sort of uh, staff who, who may not have thought that they had capacity in that space to really grown that way, whether it's a direct service provider or someone on the admin side. Um, it's particularly interesting and exciting uh, among many other things. Um, I'll pass it to Gil. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going to say two things. And they are the two things I'm in charge of, which is our TELCAP program and our Center for Excellence not because I'm in charge of them, but because of the potential they have, the really the potential to change the world. And I, I can be proud, prouder to, to have the opportunity. Uh, I'll pass it over to John. <laughs> uh, multiple choice. Uh, B become, comes before G, so I'll go. You do it. You do it. <laughs> Um, you know, the first thing that came to my mind is partnerships, partnership, partnerships. Our vision is huge. It's that all children are safe, healthy, and thriving. And when we say all, we mean all. And no matter how big Child Haven gets and and no matter, you know, how, how many programs we add into our continuum of care and how many workforce development, um, you know, strategies we implement, we will never be able to do this on our own. And so partnering with other community-based organizations, partnering with our, our government contractors, partnering with our philanthropy community um, is in, in, in other sectors. Um, we all have to come together in a different and better way than we have historically if we want to um, make outcomes better for kids and families. Mr. G. And I'm excited uh, that Child Haven is part of the Skyway Coalition and part of the Skyway community. I, I put the link in the chat. Um, Skyway is an unincorporated King County um, between Seattle and Renton. And really, it's an opportunity for us to, to live our strategic impact plan. Um, we're growing direct services there by partnering with an affordable housing provider to build an early learning and affordable housing building. 
We are working in collaboration with the school district and other community-based organizations, um, which is that indirect approach. And the Skyway Coalition is actively focused on public policy advocacy to reverse years of systemic racism and disinvestment in Skyway and to really promote community-driven development without displacement. Um, I think it's interesting that we we really had to leave Seattle and First Hill because gentrification and displacement had pushed families out of that community. Um, we don't want that to happen in Skyway. We don't want that to happen in other communities. And we have the opportunity in Skyway to be part of the active anti-displacement efforts there. Wonderful. And I, I'm excited because my whole job is to support the work of these people and all of our program staff and everybody else who's maybe not on the panel, but definitely a part of our work today. So thank you all again for joining us. Um, if you have a question that we didn't get to, um, I put an email in the chat. You can go ahead and send us an email at childhavenevents at childhaven.org and we'd be happy to get back to you um, or to get get uh, connect with you and share more information if you have additional questions. So thank you all so much for spending time with us today and we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks well, for thank being you. here.